Okay, so talking today about physical development during the first two years of life. So physical growth occurs rapidly during the first couple of years and the transition from infancy to toddlerhood, the period that spans the second year of life, is marked by the infant switch from crawling to walking. Research indicates that the height and weight of infants and toddlers occurs in little growth spurts. So early on we see a rise in baby fat, so this gives you know little babies their kind of chubby, fun, cute little appearance. Um, and and that peaks around nine months of age and this helps the small infant to keep a constant body temperature. So this is a good thing, very adaptive initially. Toddlers, however, so as they grow into that um, first and second year, toddlers become more slender, and this is a trend that continues um, into middle childhood. We also see that on the whole, girls tend to be slightly shorter and lighter than boys. So looking at the trends, so how does um, physical growth occur? There are two developmental trends. So the first is something called cephalocaudal. And cephalocaudal, this is a pattern of growth that occurs during the prenatal period in which the head develops more rapidly than the lower part of the body, okay? So the head develops more rapidly than the lower part of the body. So if you have seen um, infant children, right, you probably notice that, wow, their head is huge, right, compared to the rest of their body. So the head is very much out of proportion compared to their extremities. Proximodistal. Proximodistal is another trend a pattern of growth that proceeds from the center of the body outward. And this happens during infancy and childhood when the arms and the legs grow ahead of the hands and feet. Okay, so the extremities um, grow later than the head, the chest, and the trunk, so the center of the body. With um, child development, looking at physical development here, we need to talk about brain development. And there are exciting things that are going on here in the developing child's brain. So one of the things that is occurring is something that's called lateralization of the cerebral cortex. So your brain is divided into two sections or two halves that are called hemispheres. And these hemispheres are largely specialized. So lateralization has to do with specialized functions between the two hemispheres of your brain. So the left hemisphere then, um, the left hemisphere of your brain basically controls all of the um, sensory information and the right side of your body. So when you're moving your right hand, your left hemisphere of the brain is responsible for that. Left hemisphere also also houses things like verbal abilities, the experience of positive emotion, and this kind of logical, mathematical thinking. So if you say to someone, oh, you're very left-brained, that means that this person is probably very, very analytical, someone who is good at applying logic to solving problems, maybe someone who's very skilled at math. The right hemisphere, the other side of your brain, controls the left side of your body. So when you're waving your left hand, your right hemisphere or the right half of your brain is responsible for that. The right hemisphere is more involved in things like spatial abilities. So your ability to navigate through an area, through a particular physical space. Um, negative emotion also involved here as well. And the right hemisphere is more implicated in trying to process an entire picture or an entire scene. Um, if you are more right hemisphere dominated, then oftentimes you tend to be more, let's say, artistic, someone who's good at processing the whole instead of just individual pieces. Other things occurring in plasticity. So remember, one of the central issues in developmental psychology has to do with plasticity. So remember that ability to change or if development is relatively stable. And with the developing brain, it is highly plastic. So for infants and young children, brain plasticity occurs when parts of the brain are not yet committed to specific functions. And this allows for repair of damaged areas in the brain. So children who experience brain injury 
early in life tend to recover better from these brain injuries compared to um, people who experience them later on down the line. Once the hemispheres lateralize though, this plasticity is greatly reduced and we see that for young children, they have an overabundance of these synapses. So these are basically connections among um, particular brain cells that support the brain's plasticity, and therefore it supports young children's ability to learn. Um, so plasticity does decline over the lifespan. Your brain is the most plastic in infancy, but later on in life, our brains can actually still recover from injury. So if you have ever been around someone who's experienced a stroke later on in life um, with intense physical therapy, they can oftentimes recover perhaps some of the abilities that they had lost, maybe the ability to speak or to move you know, part of their body. Oftentimes they can recover that. So that gives us evidence that the brain continues to be plastic later on in life as well. So, okay, so looking at sensitive periods in brain development. So stimulation of the brain is vital so that's absolutely critical during periods in which it's growing more rapidly. So if um, we look at studies where individuals grow up in extremely deprived environments, so environments where they get basically no stimulation, um, you know, they might be relegated to um, a cage. So if we're looking at animal studies, relegated to a cage that basically is one color and they're not allowed to touch anyone, to move around. They don't get um, verbal stimulation. We see that um, this deprivation, extremely deprived environments results in permanent brain damage and loss of functions. So there are a couple of um, types of growth here that the young child's brain benefits from. So first we can look at experience expectant brain growth um, with the young brain rapidly developing organization that depends on exposure to ordinary experiences. So these are experiences that you would expect that the child would have. They're nothing out of the ordinary. So these are opportunities to see objects, to touch objects, to hear language and other sounds, and to explore the environment. And the developing brain responds to these particular experiences by growing in response to those experiences. The other kind is called experience-dependent growth. And with experience-dependent growth, we see that these experience expectant brain growths provide the foundation for the later occurring experience dependent brain growth. And this experience dependent brain growth is a lifelong process that consists of additional growth and refinement of these established brain structures as a result of your individual learning experiences. So as you continue to learn things in your life, as you're exposed to new experiences, new information, your brain continues to grow and develop and those are examples of experience dependent growth. So several influences on early growth we can look at the influence of heredity so this is the um, contribution from your biological mom and your biological dad. So when diet and health are adequate, so when children are having these needs met, height and the rate of physical growth are largely determined by heredity or by genetics. Genetic makeup then also affects your body weight, but the environment and especially nutrition plays a very important role too. And adequate nutrition is especially critical for development in the first two years because the baby's brain and, bo um, and body are growing so rapidly. So we'll talk about um, some of these nutritional aspects and also some aspects of malnutrition, what happens when the child is not getting the nutrients that he or she needs. So there are many benefits to breastfeeding. So breastfeeding over bottle feeding. Um, breast milk is ideally suited to the needs of babies. Um, breastfed babies in poverty-stricken regions are far less likely to be malnourished and are far more likely to survive in the first year compared to bottle-fed babies. 
Um, the World Health Organization recommends breastfeeding until age two with solid foods added at six months. Practices that, if widely followed, would save lives of more than a million infants annually. So this is around the world, of course. Um, if we look at the benefits of breastfeeding, so we look at long-term studies which show that breastfeeding for the first six months is associated with slower early weight gain, and this is a good thing um, in that it um, prevents obesity later on down the line. Breastfeeding also, you know, it's basically the correct balance of what the child needs at this particular point in development. So let's talk about when things go wrong, when we have um, malnutrition here. So we have a few specific types of malnutrition. We'll talk about each one of these in greater detail. First type is called marasmus. Um, second type is quashiorker. And then we also have um, food insecurity. Okay, so with marasmus, we see um, consequences long-term, particular physical symptoms and learning problems. With marasmus, um, this is a wasted condition of the body and it usually appears in the first year of life and it's caused by a diet that is low in all essential nutrients, okay? So the child is not getting any of the essential nutrients in a high enough quantity to sustain the child's life. Now with quashiorker, which usually appears after weaning, okay? So this is after the child is no longer breastfeeding usually happens between one and three years of age. And this is caused by an unbalanced diet that is very, very low in protein. And so the symptoms of quashiorker include an enlarged belly and swollen feet. And I'll show you a picture of what those look like here in just a second. Um, children who survive extreme forms of malnutrition grow to be smaller in all body dimensions and suffer from lasting damage to the brain, the heart, the liver, and other organs. And we can also see problems later on down the line with learning and behavioral problems. Lastly, we have food insecurity. So looking at the United States alone, about 17% of children suffer from something called food insecurity. And this is basically uncertain access to enough food to maintain a healthy, active lifestyle. And food insecurity is especially high among single parent homes and low income ethnic minority homes. So food insecurity definitely occurs in the United States. Um, Marasmus and Kwashiorkor are much more um, uncommon or much more rare in the United States. We often see these in the developing world. Okay, so looking at the difference um, between how these progress um, and how the you know physical manifestation is occurring here with marasmus and quashiorker. So with marasmus, remember, I mean the child is basically starving. So you can see this child on the left here who is literally a skeleton. Um, and then with quashiorker, we see that um, telltale symptom, right, of the enlarged belly and the swollen feet. And so remember, quashiorker is caused by that diet that is very low in protein but both are symptoms of malnutrition. Okay, so looking at how emotional well-being comes into understanding physical development in early childhood, um, we can talk about a particular condition that's called failure to thrive, or FTT. So with failure to thrive, um, this is basically a growth disorder that's present by about 18 months of age that is caused by some kind of problem. Um, oftentimes it's a combination of an organic or some kind of physical problem. So this can be something like um, the child has difficulty swallowing, maybe the child has stomach problems, gastrointestinal problems where they have a difficult time processing food. So there's usually some kind of physical problem and then there's also some kind of environmental mental or non-organic problem, and we'll talk about what some of those problems can be. Um, so usually a combination of both. The symptoms then are similar to marasmus, so we see that um, 
there is a failure to grow essentially with the developing child. And if the disorder is not corrected in infancy, most children who suffer from failure to thrive remain small and have lasting cognitive and emotional problems. So in trying to diagnose failure to thrive, we use what are called growth charts. Growth charts, um, as you can see, have weight and your age, and they are based on what's considered normal um, for a child who is a particular age. It basically tells you um, how the average child who is, for example, um, 12 months of age, how much the average child who's 12 months of age weighs, and it gives you particular percentiles. So with failure to thrive then in diagnosing it, you're going to look at a child whose height, or I'm sorry, whose weight is below the fifth percentile. So like 95% of other children who are that age weigh more than a child who is under the fifth percentile. So these children are very, very small um, for their age. So we said that failure to thrive is often caused by a combination of organic or physical problems and non-organic or environmental problems as well. So a number of potential things that could be going on here that can contribute to um, the failure to thrive in the child. So oftentimes we see that in children who have failure to thrive, there are problems in the parent-child relationship. So the child basically sees food as a way to assert their control or to assert their independence. Food is the one thing that the child can control um, to basically kind of get back at the parent. So oftentimes there might be attachment issues that are going on here where feeding times become like a battle where the the parent is trying to, you know, force feed a child and the child's like, uh-uh, I'm going to, you know, do my own thing here. You aren't there for me in other areas of my life. And so this is one way that I can get back at you. Um, we can also look at things like a poor diet, right? So if you're living in poverty, it can be difficult to get the nutritious foods that your child needs because these foods are very expensive. Um, looking at feeding techniques also, again, trying to kind of force feed a child, um, you know, sitting down with a child and saying, okay, we only have 10 minutes to eat, so you need to finish this right away. That can make feeding time not fun for a child and can lead to this food refusal where the child basically refuses to eat. Um, we can also look at problems that the parent might have, mental health issues, cognitive problems, and again, these can relate back to that attachment um, that there might not be a very strong bond between parent and child. And then if there is child abuse or neglect going on um, in the parent-child relationship, that can lead to failure to thrive as well. In looking at the treatments, um, Oftentimes you'll go to what's called a feeding clinic and within the clinic you'll have a specialist who basically observes you and your child as you go through feeding times and they'll look for a number of things but one of the things that they might look for is how much time do you spend cuddling with a child um, particularly if you're breastfeeding a child how much time do you spend cuddling with that child to kind of you know help cement that bond to create that attachment and to make feeding times enjoyable so they'll recommend that you add more of that if that's not something that you do okay so other aspects of physical development here we can look at imitation so newborn babies enter the world with a very primitive so this is kind of an inborn ability to learn through imitation so to learn by copying the behavior of others and the capacity of newborns to imitate certain gestures like you see in these pictures here, right? We have the adult at the top who is making these faces. And not only is this cute little baby imitating those faces, but we also see a cute little chimpanzee who's imitating those faces as well. Um, we have some researchers who regard that um, this ability to imitate is an automatic response, very similar to a reflex. But other researchers in the field claim that newborns imitate many facial expressions the same way that older children and adults do. By trying to match your body movements, they see with the ones they feel themselves make. 
So there is some controversy in the field, right? We don't necessarily agree on this. But what we do agree on is that imitation can be a very powerful means of learning, right, for the developing child and it can help facilitate a positive relationship between parent and child. If you make a face at a baby, right, and the baby reflects that, the baby makes that face back to you by imitating you, you're like, oh my gosh, you're so cute. You're the cutest baby ever, look at you. We are having this conversation with each other, right? And we're not even saying anything, but it can help to facilitate that bond, which is very, very exciting. Okay, so other specific trends um, in looking at the sequence of motor development. So gross motor development, remember this refers to actions that help an infant move around in the environment. So we see the general sequence, um, children start rolling over, right? And then they start crawling, standing, and walking. Um, we see with fine motor development, this involves the smaller movements like reaching and grasping. So the sequence of motor development is fairly uniform across children, but there are large individual differences in the rate of progress. So we also see that there are cephalocaudal and proximal distal trends here as well. So motor control of the head precedes control of the arms and the trunk, which comes before control of the legs. So this is a cephalocaudal trend. We see also that the head, the trunk, and the arms, the control of those appears before coordination of the hands and fingers. So this is a proximal distal trend. So in looking more at um, developing these milestones in reaching, in reaching, so how do young children learn how to do this? There are various stages, right, that children go through in learning how to reach, this fine motor development of reaching and grasping. So of all the motor skills, voluntary reaching may play the greatest role in infant cognitive development because it opens up a whole new way of exploring the environment. They can point to things, right? They can reach out, they can grab things, they can touch things, and in this way they become a very active consumer, right? An active participant in the environment. So reaching and grasping, like many of the motor skills, start out as gross motor activity. So you see over here in the pre-reaching where the child's basically you know starting to kind of begin reaching that starts as a more gross motor movement right and gradually um, moves toward this mastery of the more fine motor skills so we see pre-reaching with newborns um, around three to four months they develop what's called the ulnar grasp and with the ulnar grasp they can adjust their grip to the object, so determining you know how tightly they need to hold on to something based on that particular object, and they can move that object from hand to hand around four to five months. And then the ultimate in fine motor skills, what's called the pincer grasp. And so with the pincer grasp, demonstrated by this super cute little baby here at nine months of age, pincer grasp is basically coordinating your two fingers, specifically your thumb and your index finger, to be able to pick up a specific object, to be able to pick up something.